but I'm sure we'll hear like, and the, there's also a lag to this, so it may also be that I'm the, under the impression that it isn't happening as much because we haven't heard about it as much. But you know, we're getting information like information is coming out now about stuff like that happening in the 80s. So in like 34 years, ask me again. <laughs> oh yeah, the teens. Like, um, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who wants to? Yeah, please. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, certainly. And um, so I guess Michelle Alexander talks a lot about um, like local law enforcement agencies getting a lot of like kickbacks for more like paramilitary military supplies like from making more drug arrests. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering if like with the blurring of lines between like immigration agencies and local force, um, are they getting like financial kickbacks for making like arrests that go through fusion centers or like when ICE gets involved and that sort of thing? Um, or is it ended without being ended? Right. Um, when you say kickbacks, do you mean from the like from the manufacturers, or do you mean no? I don't say kickbacks, but I mean like in the New Jim Crow, you know, it's very well documented that local agencies they get more funding for more protective gear, higher powered uh, guns, right. and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering if there's any there's no connections with like making immigration arrests or that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean the same. Um, I, okay, so a couple things here. Um, one is that the same thing is happening with ICE, right? The, the, where um, <coughs> the about 20, 25 years ago, the military just started having kind of like a fire sale, and like all the old stuff just went into the police departments, and it went to like really cut rates, right? So like you could buy an armored personnel carrier for less than you could buy a police cruiser, right? Um, the, like some departments got helicopters just for free um, because the military was retiring them and like, you know, still perfectly good helicopters, useful for controlling ground people here, you know? <laughs> um, the, um, and so that's happening, that is definitely happening, and especially it's happening more with immigration now, it's also happening sooner. So like, they're already using drones on the border. Um, the, like the, the amount of time that it took for like, between when the military started using helicopters and the police started using helicopters was like considerable. But the amount of time between the military using drones and immigration using drones was like really short. Um, the, uh, whether, and okay, so then there's the question of like whether local police are benefiting from the kind of like, I don't know, immigration boom? Um, and in some ways, yes. Like, um, you know, I was saying before that we know that if you build jails, they'll fill them, right? Yeah. Increasingly, they're filling them with immigrants. Yeah. And local, um, uh, local uh, jails and local police departments are increasingly leasing their jail beds to the federal government for, for immigration stuff. Um, arguably, that does give them an institutional incentive to then also participate in immigration rights. Although, police leaders are very divided up as to whether that's a good idea. Um, some of them think it is because, like, racism. And some of them think it's not because uh, smarter racism. And they <laughs> <laughs> They realize that it's going to screw up all of that community policing stuff that I was talking about in the lecture. That if um, immigrant communities are afraid of the cops, then it's going to make it harder for the cops to like build trust, build those relationships, co-op leadership, and that sort of thing. And basically, the, the fear is that if there's like if you push people outside of those institutions altogether, then it's then the institution has that much less control over what they do. Yeah, please go ahead. You're very knowledgeable, it's obvious you've been, they made a Herculean effort to do the, the research you've done. I, I'm impressed. But, okay. the, but you mentioned part of the government institution that needs to be abolished is the whole prison industrial complex. Angela Davis talks about that extensively. Um, my research that, uh, it's not original research, I'm just regurgitating what I've read, shows that um, 
in the last five years, the number of detainees, immigration, petty immigration violations mostly, has doubled. In the last five years, during the Obama administration, at the same time, I noticed when I did a check on the stock prices of GEO, that while the level of detentions has roughly doubled, the stock price of GEO, which is a for-profit uh, corporation that manages these for-profit facilities for the feds where they put these people in more than that concentration camps, has doubled. Uh, there's there's a, a direct link. And, and GEO itself has warned its, <coughs> its stockholders that if immigration reform were to take hold, that the bottom might well drop out from under its stock. But so they lobby constantly for stricter laws and enforcement of those laws. What can we as a people do constructively, you know, not just rhetoric, but without being counterproductive, to break this cycle that is so obvious? with some trepidation, and I'm going to say some general things rather than particular, like, you know, like, I'm not going to break down my temple plan here. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, uh, I would say find the, so, look at the policy as it's being enforced. Look at the institutions that are responsible for enforcing it. Figure out what it is that they need and then organize people to deny them the things that they need. Um, to some degree, they need the cover of the law. To some degree, they need resources. To some degree, like financial resources, that sort of thing. To some degree, they need um, uh, a sense of legitimacy, a sense of public acceptance, which is actually probably the place where they're most vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, discrediting the, the way that they do business. Um, and then one thing that, uh, you know, law enforcement of all kinds needs maybe more than anything else is the cooperation of the public. Yes. yes. So organizing people to deny to deny them those things um, will put pressure on the institution that the institutions will respond to. So the you're, question, the question you're, you're, is like, you're saying that they, they, they need our uh, cooperation to oppress us, basically. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, that, that, is, that is the assumption built into the counterinsurgency theory, is that simply coming down on people from above with force is not going to be enough to control political opposition. That it's much better if you win their support, win their trust, win their cooperation, and then also collect information through those channels that you create. Um, yeah, please. Uh, just a couple things, com quick comment and a question. Um, a couple questions ago, someone back there asked about cooperation between the media and mm -hmm. police and as you said you, there is like I guess no evidence of direct cooperation well, but I, there's not no evidence but I don't think that this happening in a programmatic way right now okay. and I think it's happening incidentally maybe less often than it used to All right. I remember um, during the Occupy movement when I was in high school I was kind of following it and um, I wrote a little I did a little thing about um, how just the language that some of the media outlets used really manipulated the situation because they relied on police reports and stuff. Um, so they, there was this one instance where some occupiers in, up in the Seattle one had gone into a building because this neighborhood, it was a vacant building that had been purchased and was going to be renovated into an apartment complex, but the community, the neighborhood wanted to use it for you know, a community center of some kind. And so during the Occupy movement, some protesters went in and took over the building, started organizing and setting something good up, and then they ended up getting kicked out by the police, and then Como 4 News comes out with a story of Seattle, crazed anarchist protesters occupy a building and have a stand up with the police. Right. And yeah. Oh, okay, so good. I'm glad you said that. Uh, so there is a 
systematic institutional bias in the media, um, which is different than a deliberate collaboration, right? Like the, the journalists don't think of themselves typically as being like, oh, we're going to like take the police propaganda points and like feed them to the public, or they don't typically think of themselves as like, oh, we're going to go into the community and do a bunch of reporting and then like hand that to the cops. But in the way that things get covered, there is an institutional bias toward um, existing authority basically of all kinds. And some of that is because the, um, uh, you know, looking at it from, okay, there are lots of reasons. One is looking at it from a journalist's perspective, they are more inclined to trust somebody who has some identifiable, um, uh, stable position, like a police officer, like a mayor, like the head of a company, than like, uh, you know, some hippie, right? Um, and so they look at social movements and they just see this like chaos and they don't know like who is reliable or who's a trustworthy source or whatever. Um, the other is that they rely on police for information of all kinds, all the time. Um, which means that even when they see that there is something wrong with what the cops are saying, they're unlikely to publicly go after them because the police will just turn off that tap, will just stop feeding them information and suddenly they like, you know, not even about like politics or about police brutality or like whatever, suddenly they can't figure, like find out like what the address of the house fire was, right? Because they can't get the police report. Um, or it becomes much slower for them to or whatever, right? There are all kinds of ways that the, the police leverage that um, relationship. So there are systematic biases that lead journalists to cover things some ways rather than other things, other ways. Um, but there, is less of the, and also, I mean, there's also just the, the journalists are overworked and or lazy, and you get a pretty, like, you know, you're at deadline, you're short of a story, and you get a pretty clean, relatively um, innocuous press release from the cops. It's pretty easy to just, like, rewrite the headline and run the press release. Um, so to some degree, like, there's the fact that, like, the cops do some of their work for them. Um, so there are institutional biases in terms of how things get covered, but there, I don't think there's the same level of like deliberate cons like conspiring together in terms of how things get presented as there once was. Actually, not even the cops like snitches. The truth, <laughs> the truth is. Please. Um, I was going to ask about this, but since Occupy was brought up again, I know you didn't write the chapter on Occupy, um, but I would be interested if you had any stories um, about, in relationship to the Occupy movement and you, what the chapter that you did write? Um, let's see. Um, how can I relate these? The, um, I didn't write the chapter on the Occupy movement in this book. I did write a chapter on police in um, a different book that AK Press did called We Are Many. Um, and in that, I uh, basically relate the, so I was telling about the history of crowd control a little bit ago, um, and one of the things, and I sort of told the story where um, the police have a, it's like the police have a strategy, the protest movement comes up with a way to short circuit their strategy, the police have to create a new strategy, right? That hampered with escalated force in the civil rights era, that hampered with negotiated management at the WTO protests, um, and I think strategic incapacitation that happened to some degree with the Occupy movement. Because what happened was the police had their framework of like, um, these are like, this is allowable and this is and good protesters and these are disruptive bad protesters. And the Occupy movement, especially in the first stages of it, deliberately positioned itself outside of that framework and therefore became disruptive bad protesters, which then created a um, exaggerated police response in terms of you know, violence and arrests and that sort of thing. And um, which measurably increased the press attention to the Occupy movement and also the public sympathy of the Occupy movement. And so the, the movement really like wasn't 
doing particularly well until the cops decided it was a good idea to start pepper spraying people. And so I think the, the Occupy movement like tripped up the logic of the, the police were using in terms of crowd control. Interestingly, and okay, so this does relate to what I was talking about earlier, um, places where they, the cops didn't have that over the top reaction, the movement didn't do it very like well. LA. Yeah, and like here, <laughs> like here too. Um, I had a, this was a private conversation, so I'm not going to reveal the city or the person, but I had a conversation with um, a person who was the, um, just described himself as a fixer for the mayor of a mid-sized western city, who told me that um, the, they had very deliberately sort of coached the cops on, um, on basically having symbolic arrests for symbolic actions. Right? So as long as the, the encampment was, remained peaceful and was, um, as he put it, symbolic, the police would come, read an announcement that park closes at 10 or whatever, we're going to start making arrests in 20 minutes. If you would like to be arrested, please come to this area. If you would not like to be arrested, now's the time to leave your camp. He also had cultivated um, relationships with many of the more established activists and coach them on the same thing. And so at 10 o'clock, they would help sort everybody into, okay, these are the people who are gonna get arrested today, everybody else should get out. Um, and basically like did the cops job of like shutting down the camp every day. Um, and I, I could tell you the, the name of the city and you would be like, oh, I didn't even know there was an occupying <laughs> there, right? Because that's how that happened. Um, and that's to just directly borrowed from the community policing approach. Like that, that's what that, co-optation of leadership as well. What would be an alternative model of response to um, in, to a suggestion like that? Um, you mean like you're the responsible leader? And the, right, yeah. Uh, for, I mean, I think I would be, um, I don't know whether the best response would be to have, to refuse to have anything to have the conversation at all, or if the best response would be to have the conversation and then very publicly report on what that conversation was like. Um, the, and be like, wow, this is what we're trying to do, don't fall for it, right? <laughs> um, the, um, I think a bigger problem this points to is having the kind of movement where a few well-placed people can demobilize hundreds of people, um, because that kind of structure is going to invite that kind of co-optation. Or, alternately, it's going, if they refuse that kind of co-optation, it's going to invite harder forms of repression, such as like, you know, being jailed or you know, smeared or like whatever else comes next. Mm -hmm. I could uh, relay a story of, like, local story of what happened in the local Occupy Olympia and also like answer the question of what can you do instead of yeah, go. having an official, um, well, like here immediately when the cops came to talk to us, you know, a lot of people were like, don't talk to them, but so, always inevitably the liberals or whatever in the group want to go talk and they do and then they come back and re re relay the demands to us and start to tell us what we can and cannot do. And in the end, in Olympia, they negotiated a change of the actual park. So in the very beginning, we went from Sylvester to uh, um, the Heritage Park. Park. To, yeah, to Heritage. So immediately, the police sort of set the terms uh -huh. of what it's going to be. And then the same few groups of liaisons would go every evening and go talk with the people of the state capital, you know. And, they, and then they would come back, and at one point, they were even, when things got rough, I mean, it lasted, this lasted a really long time, but in the winter time when the rain was coming down and it was just shitty out there, they would, some of them would come back and offer their advice and tell us, those same people who were talking to the police, would also be a force of, like, pacification. Maybe we should pack it up, guys, you know? And so an alternative to that is 
obviously keep it to a very minimum of discussion, and that person who talks should just be a messenger from the group. They're not allowed to negotiate, uh -huh. and they're not allowed to come back and give their opinions in the discussion. They can just send information. I was going to say that, um, actually, what I was going to say, you can act very well on that um, one issue that kind of surrounded Occupy and, like, was the reason that it, things played out so differently between police and occupiers in every city is because there's a sort of structurelessness that allowed for a flexibility and experimentation in, in the movement as a whole, but um, in smaller sections in the microcosm, it sort of played out in that way where one charismatic or domineering personality could sort of set the tone for the rest of the, um, the event. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've seen work before, not occupied, but like, is to go and talk with the cops and then like listen to them and then agree with what they're saying and like that that's a really good yeah thanks for like letting us know that and then going back and um, and then figure out how you're going to organize against that and then they're going to go find the people that they talk to. You're going to be like yeah that that thing that you said totally and like. So like as you're organizing around them, like giving them a really good face, and then they're acting kind of confused when things aren't going well. I've seen that, like being able to, to push further that way. There was another hand back. Yeah, please. I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I was wondering how you think social networking sites and the internet have changed community. Um, <coughs> there is a chapter in Life During Wartime uh, titled, Who Needs the NSA When We Have Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is less funny when you learn that he swiped the title from uh, a conference of law enforcement. Um, so, uh, I don't know, do I need to say more about that? Um, okay, so the, the, the thing where Okay, so if you read, if you imagine watching a cop show, or you know, again, I can go back to the wire, and they have like a whiteboard, and they have like the pictures of the people that they're looking at, and they draw lines, and they're like, okay, so this person is this person's cousin, but they kind of hate each other, and like all of that, and they do all of that mapping stuff. Um, it's a lot of work, it's a pain in the ass, except Facebook just does that. Right? It just shows who is connected to who, and, and to some degree how. Um, and, as is documented in the chapter, the police have, have realized this and make use of that, and really, uh, sometimes really aggressively make use of that. And then they also have taken to um, using, and so along with that, they can also use updates to like get some self-reported information on what people are doing in particular times and where they were and that sort of thing. It's very easy to like assemble um, a kind of low-grade profile of like what someone has been up to based on their their Facebook their Facebook posts. Um, I mean, I'm picking on Facebook, but this is true of sort of everything Facebook-like, right? Um, and then similarly, things that people have posted there have shown up in uh, in, for example, court hearings as reasons to deny, to deny the bail or um, evidence of a conspiracy based on people reposting calls for action, things like that. So yeah, they're making the most of it. Um, going back to the NSA, one of the more interesting uh, revelations, I think, from, um, from the Snowden documents is that the NSA has also deliberately manipulated um, internet postings and have you know created sock puppet accounts and then like gone after people for the sake of you know um, discrediting their reputation or gone after particular social scenes for the sake of you know getting people getting their playing on right um, for the sake of disrupting political organizing and we know that they did that in other countries but I think it's <coughs> only a, a fair assumption that the local cops are doing a Bush League version of the same thing every chance they get. Uh, 
Can I just add to sure. what your comment is? I spent a lot of time listening, monitoring the police scanner. You don't have to be genius. And they have computers in their cars now, and I hear them getting a call to address or a person's name from the dispatcher, and I've actually heard them talking about before they arrive, they look up their Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and they go, oh, well, you know, apparently they know this. Yeah, they actually talk about it over the public airwaves that anybody can listen to on this scanner. So it's true, the police know about Facebook, they use it, yeah, they do. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, um, I guess there's certain times when, like, they're like, It's a good observation. And the, the thing about, so the problem here is that, I mean, the problem from the state's perspective is that counterinsurgency is largely about concessions. It's largely about providing services, giving people stuff as a way of building legitimacy and building their allegiance and, and developing those relationships of dependency that were mentioned earlier, right? Neoliberalism is about the opposite of that. It's about taking all of that shit away. Um, and so, you know, there are a couple of different ways that you can try to understand this. One is that um, neoliberalism is like the capitalist state and on the offensive, and counterinsurgencies and it's defensive. One is that neoliberalism makes messes and the counterinsurgency comes and cleans them up. Um, <laughs> Uh, the one of them is that when um, the state is like there's a balance of power between the state and the ruling class as such, and when the state is um, more autonomous than not, we see something like counterinsurgency. It's a state-centered strategy. When the ruling class is more autonomous than not, we see neoliberalism. It's a economic strategy, right? Um, I don't like. I haven't studied enough of the details of neoliberalism or the um, the interrelation there to really know which of these theories is best. Um, the thing that I think is interesting, though, is that the uh, contradictions within each of them may be more important than the contradictions between them. So counterinsurgency relies on like the whole game here is building legitimacy. But it mostly does that in defense of systems that are fundamentally illegitimate. Like it's challenged for it because the thing it's trying to preserve is inequality, um, which is just inherently discredited. Uh, on the other hand, neoliberalism, the whole program is this kind of um, decentering of the state, but it relies on a repressive state in order to overcome um, popular resistance. And at the end of the day, the the real limit that both of them face is exactly the same, and that's popular resistance. 